film excursion into past events, events which form the patterns by which we live today. Retrospect is brought to you by the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization in cooperation with your local civil defense office and your local station. And now here's your host, Douglas Edwards. Each post-war period since the dawn of man has brought with it a wild period of restoration, reorganization, and just plain irresponsibility. But none of them hold a candle to the fantastic period of the wacky years, 10 of them, making whoopee and ain't we got fun that followed World War I. Returning from the battlefields of Europe, the American doughboy marched into the roaring 20s to discover a new and different America. He found a nation basking in the sunshine of prosperity. He found a carefree, giddy society in which everyone was the life of the party. He found the flapper, wearing skirts higher and stockings lower, who would uh, share his bed of roses for 10 dizzy, high-flying years. And then he would discover that his wonderful utopia had a built-in trap door. In 1920, two radical changes were made in America. The first, woman suffrage. The voting booth had gone co-educational. The ladies considered it quite a feather in their caps. The shock would send the returning doughboy to the nearest saloon, and there he would discover the second change, something called prohibition. While he was away, someone had given the country back to the Puritans. America had gone bone dry. But the doughboy would soon discover the bootlegger, and armed with 10 years of inspired literature, a hip flask and a flapper, he would sit back and watch the headlines roll by. And there were headlines aplenty. Sacco and Vanzetti, one of the most controversial murder trials of all time. In Dayton, Tennessee, the trial of John Scopes, accused of assaulting the book of Genesis by teaching evolution in the public schools. For the prosecution, the Honorable William Jennings Bryan, defender of the faith. For the defense and the infidels, Clarence Darrow. The court-martial of Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, envisioning a future when the airplane would play a vital role in time of war, Mitchell put his outspoken views in a book called Our Air Force. The book criticized national defense policies. Mitchell was court-martialed and suspended from the service. While President Harding played the tuba, government oil reserves were being turned over to private interest. Harding died before the full impact of the Teapot Dome scandal hit the nation's headlines. In 1926, the feminine hearts of America went to pieces. Outside of Campbell's funeral parlor in New York, mounted police became frantic trying to keep a crowd of 30,000 tearful mourners from open rioting. Rudolph Valentino, the great lover, the Latin with the bedroom eyes that enslaved women and drove men to despair, was dead. Charles Lindbergh, all the world would come to know him as the Lone Eagle. All other news disappeared from the headlines after the young Minnesotan took off from Mitchell Field, New York, and 33 and one half hours later set down the spirit of St. Louis at La Berger Field in Paris, the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic. During the madness of prohibition, Al Capone emerged as public enemy number one. While the country was dry, his take was 100 million a year. In 1927, Al Jolson blazed the trail of talking pictures with the jazz singer. The experiment was a sensational success. Movie attendance jumped 60 million in two years. The silent film died a quiet, sudden death. To a carefree, happy, wealthy America, it seemed there would be no end to Coolidge prosperity. And they were right. The end came with Hoover prosperity. But if movies were wired for sound, the economy was not. On October 29, 1929, the stock market crashed. The memorable Variety headline put it better, Wall Street lays an egg. After 10 years of wild prosperity, there was nothing left but ticker tape dreams and the tear-filled rims of rose-colored glasses. Well now, let's take a moment off from the past for a vital message about the present. There are many important issues facing the American public today. All of them center on one word, survival. Yours, mine, the survival of the entire free world. 
We must realize that the goal of Soviet leaders is domination of the world by communism. They intend to use all means, economic, propaganda, perhaps even military, to reach this goal. Total war requires total defense. The Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization points out that military might alone is not enough. The director of OCDM has called upon every American to prepare his home and family against possible attack. On these programs, we will bring you the facts on civilian preparedness and the need for an effective civil defense. Many people ask, why do we need civil defense? It's a fair question, and there are many valid answers. To give some of those answers, we have with us Dr. Paul McGrath, Deputy Director of Intelligence and National Security Affairs for the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization in Washington, D.C. Dr. McGrath, we've all seen pictures of nuclear bombs. We know the tremendous destruction they cause. We've heard about the effects of radiation. Now, facing all this, do you honestly believe survival is possible in a nuclear war? Of course I believe it, but let me emphasize that my belief is substantiated by facts. The Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization, the Atomic Energy Commission, and many independent research groups have done a great deal of study on the problem of radioactive fallout. Now they have come up with one sensible answer, home shelter. For, exa for example, a shelter like this one would give excellent protection against radiation. A recent study of national preparedness concluded that adequate shielding is the only effective means of preventing, preventing radiation casualties. Another study proved that the simple addition of fallout shelters in every home could reduce our casualties by 75 percent. With so many potential trouble spots in the world, nuclear war could erupt at any time, I take it. Well, that's certainly true. But here's another reason for the importance of fallout shelters and a prepared population. If we're going to stop communist encroachment throughout the world, we might be forced to make decisions carrying the risk of war. Our president can make these decisions with greater confidence if our people are prepared. And you think civil defense is the answer? Yes. Considering the powerful nuclear weapons that are in the arsenals of nations today, an effective deterrent that could tip the balance in our favor would be a prepared population. Now, naturally, we will always need a strong military force, but we have a strong military force. We also need a prepared people. Well, Dr. McGrath, how about the Russians? Do they have a civil defense? Yes, indeed. They've had an intensive program for years, and the Soviet government has required everyone to take a minimum of 46 hours of civil defense training during the past few years. Now, the Soviet Civil Defense Organization reaches into the life of every Soviet citizen. Now, here are some actual Soviet training posters. As you can see, they are giving their people much the same kind of information that we give. Of course, the big difference is this. The Russians are compelled to take the training courses and to learn the material and to prepare their homes. Let's take an example. If an attack on the United States ever came, well, couldn't the military take care of the civilians? Well, the task of the military is to conduct military operations. But primarily, they would be carrying the war to the enemy. Initially, we civilians would be on our own. It's our job as civilians to take care of ourselves so that we could recover and win. Well, those are certainly very convincing facts, Dr. McGrath. We've heard them, we've listened to them very carefully, I'm sure. Now tell us something equally as important. What do we do about them? Well, it's time to act on the facts, Mr. Edwards. If our people are to be prepared at home, they must decide to take the necessary steps. Now, the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization provides the information and training, and it's up to each family to get the information, to study the information, and to act on it so that no matter what happens, our nation will be prepared and ready. I certainly hope we shall be. We've heard the facts. We've learned part of the answer from Dr. Paul McGrath. Now we must do something about it. Poverty, said Aristotle, is the parent of revolution and crime. Since 1900, the great majority of the people of Cuba have lived in poverty. Since 1900, the Cuban politics has been a hotbed of crime and revolution. After the Spanish-American War, the land which had known no political freedom in 400 years of Spanish rule suddenly gained independence. From that time on, political corruption and public unrest have dominated the Cuban scene. President Theodore Roosevelt intervened to settle the new nation's first internal disorder in 1906. Cuba then enjoyed an 18-year period of relative calm.
until Gerardo Machado became her fifth president in 1924. In his first four-year term, Machado increased the protection of Cuban industry and carried through a number of reforms. But by 1928, he began to show dictatorial tendencies. Using terrorist methods, he ensured himself another four years in office. His campaign of terror continued until 1933. Then the army deserted him. The Machado regime was overthrown and replaced by a provisional government headed by Carlos de Cespedes. A month later, the country was the scene of renewed riots. There was mutiny in the army, a mutiny supported by university students, intellectuals, and professionals. The Cespedes government toppled before it ever had a chance to get started. Cubans cheered the leader of the army mutiny, an obscure army sergeant named Fulgencio Batista, seen on the left. The gentleman in the middle, Ramon Grau San Martin, became the new president. Batista was promoted to colonel and placed at the head of the army. From there, he became the real power in Cuban politics. Between 1934 and 1940, Batista installed seven different presidents in office. He consolidated his own power by allowing the communists to organize politically, which gave him the backing of labor and set the stage for him to run for the presidency in 1940. Amid charges of election frauds, he was elected by a large majority. He legalized the communist-controlled labor organizations and assumed leadership of Cuban unions. Batista respected the constitutional provision prohibiting re-election and did not run in 1944. But in 1952, he came back to lead another brief revolt. He was once again dictator of Cuba, suspending the constitution and stifling political opposition. But Batista had one opponent who refused to be stifled. And on New Year's Day, 1959, Fidel Castro brought about the last of Cuba's political upheavals. At first, many Americans saw the bearded revolutionist as Cuba's long-awaited emancipator. But Dr. Castro gradually made America hostile to his policies. He inaugurated a revolutionary agrarian reform program and began to appropriate American-owned property. These acts were followed by Castro's violent tirades against the United States. Cuba a very small island with very large problems. We hope we've provided an interesting insight into the past, and we hope we've underlined the importance of the fact that simple, inexpensive home shelters can save millions of lives in case of nuclear war. As little as $100 can buy your family insurance against the greatest threat of nuclear attack, radioactive fallout. It's up to each of us to take the responsibility for preparing our homes and families. The Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization has prepared several home shelter plans and makes them available to you without cost. Contact your local civil defense office or write to OCDM, Battle Creek, Michigan. This is Douglas Edwards saying goodbye for now and reminding you to be on hand when we again bring you the great news events and personalities in retrospect. <laughs>